The world needs heroes. Individuals with the drive and talent to rise above all others. Using sheer force of will to change what's possible. But at Swift, we know every success story has a team behind the scenes. Because for the last 50 years, we've been supporting your success stories. Keeping the world connected across more than 200 countries. Delivering with excellence built on trust. Giving you the latest tools to make transactions instant and frictionless. Helping value flow where it's needed. And innovating as technology and society changes. We're making finance a simple, seamless and standardised part of our lives. And keeping complexity behind the scenes. So whatever your next challenge, we'll be here for you. Whether that's financing global enterprise or helping small businesses thrive. Because with best-in-class infrastructure, we are your support team. Helping you achieve the heroics that move our industry forward. Swift, shaping the future of finance together. Hello, hola, and oi to everyone joining us online today. Today we're talking about interoperability, and to demonstrate interoperability is a reality, we have a participant in Spain, one in Brazil, and one in the UK. While all of us speak different languages at home, somehow we're going to discuss a complex payment topic with complete transparency, and hopefully with no recalls, rejects, or returns. And we'd love to address some of your questions as well. So please feel free to post those uh, in LinkedIn and we will do our best to pick up a few of those towards the end of the discussion. Okay, I think that's enough a preamble. Let's get down to business. Carlos and Jose Luis, I'm gonna ask each of you to give us a little introduction and share the role your organizations play in the instant payments space. Carlos, maybe let's start with you and uh, could you give us a quick introduction to PIX? Sure. Uh, well, it's morning here in Brazil, but I know there are a lot of people from all over the globe with us today. So good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everyone. Uh, thanks, Mike, for inviting me to discuss this important and exciting topic of cross-border payments and how fast payment systems can contribute to, to make them more efficient. So my name is Carlos Brandt. I'm the head of PIX Management and Operations at the Central Bank of Brazil responsible for both the onboarding and monitoring, or and monitoring of uh, payment service providers, the ESPs in PIX, and also the design and implementation of new products. So uh, PIX itself is the fast payment scheme uh, in Brazil. Uh, it is, uh, it is the, 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 let's say the, the rules and setting the rule the pick setting the rules for the provision of payment service to end users by the PSPs but the PIX ecosystem also has uh, two dedicated uh, operation platforms uh, the Cephalos platform runs 24 by 7 it settles the, the PIX transactions and also the Alias and anti-fraud database uh, both operated by the central bank um, the central bank of Brazil uh, PIX is intended to serve pretty much the any use case in the domestic market, so including individuals, companies, uh, the government. PIX is part of the Brazilian digital public infrastructures, as we say, uh, and as the government, as the payment block of the DPI, the digital public infrastructure. So uh, we consider PIX as a public good that serves our society to promote digital inclusion, to promote uh, uh, better conditions for our citizens and also to improve uh, uh, better conditions for businesses, of course, for, for companies. Uh, so it's fair to say that this has been achieving uh, those objectives as it has been adopted by individuals of all income and educational levels uh, across all regions of Brazil. More than 
140 million individuals or more than 80 percent of our, our adult population are, are using uh, pigs nowadays out of these numbers more than 70 million individuals made uh, their first digital transfer with pigs uh, which means that we are seeing uh, a strong financial inclusion process here uh, with pigs it also has been adopted by all kind, all kind of uh, merchants so more than 70 percent of all businesses with any relationship with the financial uh, financial system are using pigs so uh, being that relevant in the domestic level we do believe that pigs uh, can play a very important role in improving the cross-border payments from and to brazil so thanks again mike and i'm, I'm very excited to to share this live session with you and Jose Luis. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Carlos. Jose Luis, uh, may maybe you could tell us a little bit about yourself and the unique role IberPay plays as an operator in Europe's common shared instant payment scheme. Okay, thank you, Mike, and thank you, Sue, for inviting me to share with you what is happening in, in Europe. It's a good afternoon here. So uh, I like the, the way you, you approach uh, Iberpay uh, with a unique proposition. Uh, we believe that we have, do have a unique proposition. Uh, we started with this uh, success story uh, six years uh, ago, so, and it looks like it is a, a very good uh, and has changed a, a little bit the society in, in Spain and in Europe uh, because we, we were pioneering uh, uh, instant credit transfers in, in November to, uh, 2017. Very soon, uh, all the banks or most of the banks engaged. Now, I can say that virtually all accounts of uh, in Spain can be reached uh, with instant payments. Together with the rails and the, um, and, and the reach came the transactions. Nowadays, we made more uh, instant credit transfers than traditional credit transfers. Our migration rate is uh, 52 so it's a uh, well about our lead in europe in in this so it's a uh, it's quite a success uh, uh, we are it, it, this is not a pitch but we are happy with the performance of the, our system we can do transactions end-to-end -end in between 600 and 700 milliseconds and that uh, makes uh, that these rails are perfect for all kind of uh, use cases because uh, very soon the, the transactions could be a reach uh, to the beneficiary and the beneficiary can uh, make another transaction and that keeps the uh, speed and uh, to the economy and helps the GDP to, to go. Um, we have welcomed also a fintech uh, to our community. So it's, it is not only banks, it's fintechs and the fintechs can, uh, can be connected directly to, to the pay. We have a, a lovely, um, value added service uh, called Bizum in, in Spain uh -huh. with more than half of the Spanish population, 25 million uh, uh, users are actively using uh, Bizum and they can not only make a peer-to-peer -peer payment, but they, they can pay on the on the e-commerce, they can uh, pay to professionals uh, and very soon uh, they are likely to pay on the brick and mortar commerce. So, but we don't stop here. We have launched request to pay, uh, pioneering request to pay in, in Europe with endless possibilities. Um, and not stopping here is uh, what we are aiming is to use these beautiful rails to facilitate uh, cross-border payments, uh, which is the new frontier. Indeed, it is the new frontier. I didn't realize 52% now instant in, in Spain. That's quite, a, quite amazing. Yes, Congratulations. Yes. And Thank um, you. Ca Carlos, um, you know, Likewise, the, the adoption of PICS has been amazing. You, you mentioned some incredible numbers there, so congrats on your achievement. I know nothing happens by by accident for, for both of you. Um, you know, there's, there's been a lot of hard work behind the scenes to, to achieve the results you've, you've, you've both managed. But so far, um, the focus has been on domestic payments, so what we've, we've been looking at. But if I look across the world, we really see that growing trend towards domestic instant payment systems now opening up to accept cross-border payments. Jose Luis, you... you Kind of alluded to this. Um, may I ask, I mean, you know, Banco Central do Brazil now has started thinking about um, about cross-border payments. How, how do you see you might achieve that in future? Uh, it, well, we, we have uh, 
not, not only already started thinking about how we can achieve this or use PIX to, to help uh, the improvement of cross-border uh, payments, but actually we have thought about it since the initial design of PIX. Uh, and that's why we, we are using international technical standards that would make any future interlink easier. So in a wider perspective, uh, we must remember that Brazil is committed to the G20 in improvement, uh, improving cross-border payments in terms of speed, uh, cost, access, and transparency. Uh, therefore, it is quite natural that we explore how PIX can contribute uh, to achieving what we have committed to, right? So yeah. in our evolving agenda, and as we call uh, the new uh, features and, and the future roadmap that we have uh, here in PIX, which is always discussed in the PIX forum, a uh, multilateral uh, body that we have to discuss all the, the, the new uh, things and improvements in PIX. We have right now uh, number one um, discussions on new security features and improvement in, in existing mm -hmm. ones as the security is one one of the most important pillar in PIX ecosystem. Two, the PIX Automatico, which I call AutoPIX in English, which is our new uh, product for recurring payments. And three, PIX International. So PIX International is not a product yet. It's just a, a working stream right now, but it's a working stream uh, that aims to explore alternative for interlinking PIX with other fast payment systems. So we have uh, it started to uh, to explore both bilateral links and multilateral links. And meanwhile, we have adapted our rule book, the, the PIX rule book, to, to allow PIX international transfers using what we call a partner institution or an EFS, EFX provider, uh, as it is called in our in our regulation here. So splitting the, 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 the transaction in basically in two. So the first leg would be a peak domestic transaction from payer to the EFX, and then a second leg, an international transfer from the EFX to the non-resident payee. So this uh, already allows the, uh, the use case of Brazilians buying in international e-commerce, for example, or even Brazilian buying something uh, in a physical store abroad uh, with the store generating a big QR code and presented it to, to the consumer. Uh, so, I mean, that's how we are uh, exploring. And, and as I said, we are very committed to uh, to improving the cross-border payment. Okay. okay, so you've got the, the merchant side covered at the moment, but the step step forward to, to the person-to-person -person transfers, that's the next the next stage yeah yeah it is uh, but also for the for the merchant side uh we foresee improvements on that transaction so not having the the, the necessity to to split the transactions in two but just to make a simple transaction an instant transaction directly from the payer's account to the merchant's account uh, uh abroad so there's room for improvement in, in the merchant transaction as well Understood. Thank you very much. Maybe Jose Luis, let's switch to you. So in Europe, um, the OCT install, the one leg out credit transfer scheme, that's coming in November, so just one month away. And our teams have been collaborating together, um, preparing um, for cross-border instant payments into your domestic network. Could you tell us a little bit about your journey and perhaps share any lessons uh, you've learned along the way with Carlos that could guide, help guide his thinking uh, <laughs> about the right approaches that uh, that Brazil can take? It's very difficult to give lessons to Carlos <laughs> and, because what they have already done is, is amazing. But but if my, my vision, uh, I can share with him and, and with the audience my vision. My vision is first, uh, uh, instant payments are becoming the new norm. It is a question of time. It uh, could be in a couple of years, could be in 10, but it but, but will be the new norm. Uh, I cannot explain uh, children that the payments are not uh, instant and frictionless, and uh, so that that is that will happen. And once we have the beautiful rails of instant payments, let's use it for all use cases. And mm. cross-border payments, it's uh, it's another use case. And and on top of this, 
if that was not enough, we had the pressure of the authority saying, hey, your uh, cross-border payments are not uh, speedy enough, uh, they, they are too costly, uh, they are not so much transparent. And precisely, instant payments are perfect fit to make uh, these uh, objectives uh, happen. So my my advice is, is uh, engage with the, uh, with the community. It's easy for the central banks. They can call the community and they will also up. It's a little bit more difficult for us. And technically, it's not a big deal. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you started in the video as I say, uh, let's uh, keep complexity out of the scene and we will uh, fix it out, out of the scene. I completely agree with you. Uh, there are technical issues, there are compliance, there are business behind uh, the scenes. We will fix it. It's, uh, it's our job. And, and uh, we, uh, when I say we, is the communities, is uh, is the infrastructures, is SWIFT, is the banks, of course, mm -hmm. is the correspondent banking model. This is something that you have been doing for ages and you do it very well. Let's let's leverage on what we have, the knowledge and the and the way we do things and and, and use the instant payments to make it faster, cheaper and all what it is required. And and we will do it not only because uh, the um these bodies are requiring us, it is it is our clients who are demanding and and, and a little bit underserved uh, on this cross-border payment. Let's make it better in the near future. Brilliant. Thank you, Jose Luis. Um, maybe I'll just share one slide with the audience quickly. SWIFT has identified four models as part of our study of instant payment uh, systems interoperability. So if we look at that slide uh, now, uh, if we look at model one, uh, model one is the predominant correspondent banking model today. So about 50% of cross-border payments settle across an RTGS for their final leg. Model two, exactly the same, except the final leg settling across an instant payment system where this is allowed. So like the OCT inst, uh, we, we were just discussing that that will, will happen next month in, in Europe. Model three, um, Carlos mentioned uh, interlinking. Model three is really this bilateral interlinking of two instant payment systems such as Thailand's PromPay or Singapore's PayNow. And model four really goes beyond this to establish multilateral interlinking of instant payment systems again. Carlos mentioned this is of interest uh, for Brazil. So over the last year, um, SWIFT has been engaging with the global banking community to understand how best SWIFT can support instant payment systems interoperability across all of these models. And everyone we've spoken to without fail believes all four models uh, will coexist with each other. Okay, that's enough slides maybe. Uh, let's, get back to, let's get back to the discussion. So um, we've got different models. Um, you've both mentioned both. I'm keen to hear from both which models appeal to you and why. Let's let's start with you, Carlos. Why why the interlinking? Uh, yeah, as I said, uh, in the work stream of uh, Peaks International, we are exploring both bilateral interlink and multilateral interlink. Uh, we believe that uh, interlinking of two or more uh, fast payment systems has a strong benefit of connecting immediately the whole market uh, mm -hmm. of two different jurisdictions and also the respective end users, right? So it's not only the PSPs, but also connecting all the, the end users that are, are already connected to the fast payment system. So uh, the interlink uh, can take the advantage of uh, what the connected fast payment systems have in terms of user experience uh, using the Elias database, the banking app, the APIs, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a matter of extending the use of existing solutions for domestic payments to cross-border payment, right? Uh, with just a few adjustments, of course. Uh, it is clear to us that uh, a bilateral uh, link is easier uh, and faster to achieve and can mm -hmm. make sense for those jurisdictions that uh, have for example, a strong bilateral commercial relationships or they need uh, a, a bilateral corridor for remittances, for example. Uh, on the other hand, the cost of maintaining multiple agreements and arrangements can be an issue if you end up with uh, too many interlinks, too many bilateral interlinks. Uh, the multilateral arrangements are 
or, or interlinks are much more efficient in theory, but considerable, considerably harder to implement. Uh, so we have to discuss with multiple jurisdictions and operators and be able to achieve a multilateral agreement, not only on technical aspects, but also on governance framework. So you might uh, also need uh, an organization to run the multilateral arrangement or platform, which mm -hmm. can be uh, also very challenging. Uh, as a last remark on this topic here, Mar uh, I would like to suggest uh, you, you presented in our slide a very uh, comprehensive and, and clear uh, four models. So I would like to suggest just one uh, mm -hmm. additional model between maybe between model three and model four, or a variation or of model three or a variation of model of model four. So in this model, maybe uh, of course it doesn't uh, exist at, at this stage, but uh, maybe we could explore uh, some key fast payment systems interlinking among themselves, and they and the, and these key fast payment systems being a hub for mm -hmm. regional fast payment systems. So this could be a way that we could explore to achieve the benefits of a multilateral interlink without all the difficulties of having uh, a big platform of, of multiple uh, fast payment systems and without all the maintenance costs of uh, multiple bilateral links. Okay, so something to link the different networks together. Yeah, 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 that's it. Yeah, that's it. And to conclude here, we might not achieve the perfect uh, solution, but uh, it's clear that we have a lot of space, a lot of room for substantial improvement. Okay, network of networks. Thank you for the suggestion. I much appreciate that. Jose Luis, on your side, which, which preference do you have and, and why? Um, it's, it's difficult because um, <laughs> it is quite likely that uh, all uh, models uh, will coexist in the in the near future. So, for me, it's uh, what to say a preference. Uh, but if, if you ask my my preferred one is is model two. We have seen correspondent banking model working very well for many years, and model two is not it is not a, just a variation of of a correspondent banking. It's using instant payments at the beginning. And at the end of, a, of, a, of the transactions in the first and last mile can make a huge difference. Because mm -hmm. uh, if we can make it instant at the beginning and at the end, it's fine. If we can uh, overlap in the systems 24 by 7 and can make transactions around the clock, it makes a huge difference. In terms of course, if you use instant payments at the beginning and at the end, that the cost is is a fraction of the cost of the uh, RTGS systems, and we can put all uh, many other things: uh, trustability, uh, transparency. Uh, we can feed the the, you, um, the Swift tracker and provide the, the clients with uh, transparency. All together with the uh, co uh, with the trust and uh, and and deficiencies that the banks are are providing. So for me have some sympathy with this uh, uh -huh. uh, model too that uh, and and we can use what the banks are accustomed to do correspondent uh, banking and the new rails of instant payments if we combine this together without uh, making uh, big investments and using uh, what they are accustomed to to do they can make a huge difference for their clients and and that's what i see model 2 as uh, my preferred one but i don't uh, Disregard that other models, uh, in, including this fifth uh, model that uh, Carlos <laughs> has mentioned, could happen, and, and, and many others. But uh, but let's start by by simple one and adding efficiency on the correspondent banking. That would be fantastic for me. Okay, perfect. So, as they say in the classics, it takes two to tango. Um, so if if different jurisdictions are adopting different models. Um, is is the dancing is dancing the cross border tango tango still possible? Um, I, I think I've heard the the term um, used to describe some of this is a uh, reciprocity. Do you guys agree? This this um, you know it, both sides have to give and take something to to make the dance work, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. For me, the reciprocity means that I can receive transactions from Brazil, but they should be able to accept transactions from from Europe. And um, if this happens, we can fix uh, the other things: is the compliance, the legal, the standards, and and everything. And that's for me the, the the most important requirement. And what I mean by reciprocity, it's a it's a yeah. I, Instead of tango, I I rather play <laughs> football with uh, Carlos, and it's a, I can pass the ball to to Brazil, and Brazil can pass the ball to to Spain, to Europe, and that that, that that's my vision, rather than and, tango. And everyone wins, rather than they needing to yes. be one winner, right? Carlos, yes. you agree? Yeah, I do agree. I mean, uh, I would love to play to play soccer with uh, with <laughs> Jose Luis and and make a good team together. Uh, we also can uh, dance samba, uh, not only tango, but uh, I mean, uh, there is a strong international understanding that cross-border payments must be improved in terms of, as I said, cost, speed, transactions, and transparency. So, in that in, in that sense, we can we can say that we share the same problem, right? So, having the same problem gives us enough incentives to work together to find a solution. Of course, uh, adopting the same solution, the same model would be would make things a little bit easier, if I could put it in that way. Uh, but each, each jurisdiction has its own pre-existing systems, infrastructures, mm-hmm. models. It has different banking systems, different regulators, uh, different financial market infrastructures, different fast payment systems. And as uh, Jose Luis said, um, uh, we could also benefit from uh, all we have already right now and, and, and make the, 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 the improvement in a way that uh, we have uh, a low cost solution for, for our problem. So uh, having the same problem does not necessarily mean that we agree on the same solution, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the, as I said, the context of each jurisdiction can result in a preference or choice of different models. Uh, there is no right and, or wrong here, just different models right. that can fit better in each context. Uh, and having this in mind, uh, the most important thing is finding a feasible way to improve the cross-border payments and make sure that whatever model we adopt, uh, we connect to jurisdictions in, in, in both ways for incoming and for outcoming uh, payments, just like uh, Jose Luis said, and just agreeing with him here. Uh, so that's what, uh, the same way, that's what I don't understand by reciprocity, right? So together with mutual cooperation among jurisdictions, have this capability of incoming and, and, and outcoming payments is key. Whatever solution we implement without reciprocity, we would leave behind a great potential for improving cross-border payments and would not deliver a strong solution for our, for, for our market. Very, very well said, Carlos. So I, I'm just um, looking at questions here because I, I want to make sure that we do one or two before we, we finish. And um, maybe one that, that's very practical here. So, okay, we've spoken about the coexistence of multiple models, but what really makes that coexistence manageable at a practical level? What are the things that we have to have to do? I, I think um, th- there's been some discussion. I, I think at the at the beginning, Carlos, you mentioned the the... Um, adoption of global messaging standards, you know, looking at, at what you can adopt. Um, uh, Jose Luis, you mentioned the UETR and or tracking the unique end-to-end transaction reference number and end-to-end tracking uh, GPI. Uh, anything else we need to add on that list of practical things that exist regardless of the model? Yeah, maybe pre-validation is a, is a, is a project that you are you are trying to mm-hmm. push and I think it's, a, it's key for, for this. But uh, again, these are complexities of the of the city, and we will and we will tackle. We will take care. I don't see any technical issue, any technical problem to make it happen. It's, and especially if, if the correspondent banking model is 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 here to be adopted and to because uh, also all solutions have been seen and have been adopted and work for many years. So. Mm-hmm. It is. Uh, I don't see any technical uh, problem uh, on, and, and and of course we we have the tools uh, to make it happen. UATR, 
uh, uh, standards, uh, pre-validation, so on. Let's use it. Let's use it wisely behind the scene. I don't. I don't need to pass this complexity to my clients. That's a that's a great thought. Okay, I'm just looking. We've we've come up to time. Where did it go? I think we're just getting started in this discussion. But uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for taking the time today to discuss this vital topic of interoperability in the context of instant payment systems and all payment systems uh, that, that might come. Uh, what I take away from this discussion is that the key to interoperability is this concept of reciprocity, the practice of exchanging and sharing things for mutual benefit, you know, not for individual good, but for mutual benefit. Uh, and if we approach problems with this mindset and agree on common foundations for the greater good, then interoperability can truly be the answer to instant cross-border payments. Thank you all at home for watching and joining us and see you next time. Thank you.